present a paper which is available if you want to have it. I have a copy here. Oh. Uh, we have a few copies. We can email them as well, well that would be nice. which summarizes a manuscript that he's put together for, for borders and globalization uh, called Anthropocene Geopolitics, Globalization, Security and Sustainability. And the paper is called The New Context for Sustainability, Anthropocene and Geopolitics. Um, very exciting work. Simon Dalby um, is the Environment and Su Su Sustainability Security Research Chair at the Basel School. At least he used to be. I don't know if the chair anymore. is over. It still <coughs> is. is. Uh, he's a he's a CG um, senior research so the Center for Innovation and Governance um, in Ontario. He's a senior fellow there and he's a professor of geography and environmental studies at Whitfield Laurier. He was at um, Cal at uh, Carlton for maybe 20 years and he's the former editor of Geopolitics, which is the most prominent journal in the area worldwide. And uh, we're really lucky because he has a little hide and seek place. He has a little place where he hides and writes all his books in, um, <laughs> in the region. So we're very lucky to have him uh, this year. And Simon is going to present the research that I just talked about. And please join me in welcome in Simon Dalby. Thank you so much. Okay, um, the new context for sustainability is the title. I want to highlight that uh, third word in there. I'm a geographer, although geographers don't usually talk about it very much. What we all actually do in some sense or another are contextual studies. Context is what we do. We just never actually write about what we do in precisely those terms. Um, so what I want to think about um, uh, is the context within which we then think about borders and sustainability. Um, and uh, I want to just start by giving a little bit of background about how I got to where this paper actually is, uh, because the, um, I've been thinking about sustainability for a long time. I've been thinking about geopolitics for a long time. Um, and in fact, I was in Edinburgh, Edinburgh, I think it was Edinburgh, um, in 2012 um, at the annual meeting of the, uh, the, the geographers in Britain. Um, and uh, listening to Stuart Eldon um, doing a talk about uh, boundaries and borders and suggesting that we needed to emphasize very much the vertical um, because flat geopolitics um, wasn't grappling with some of the more obvious material dimensions of geopolitics. Uh, we needed to think both about tunnels and borders and what went on over our heads, um, vertical geopolitics. Um, he went on to suggest um, that maybe we needed to rethink this a little more fundamentally in terms of volumes. Um, secure the volume was his title, if I remember correctly. Um, and then um, Phil Steinberg got up and announced that I was doing the next year's or the next political geography lecture. And I went, oh, did I agree to do that? Um, apparently I did. Um, and then it dawned on me that, in fact, Stuart had just offered me the perfect way into thinking uh, about climate change in particular, because of course the most important volumetric measure in geopolitics these days is surely um, the parts per million by volume of carbon dioxide um, in the atmosphere. And so it got me to thinking in terms of the materialities of geopolitics, um, clearly um, we need to be thinking about not just flat geopolitics and vertical geopolitics, but can we think about this as a series of boundaries understood in terms of volumes? Um, that three-dimensional notion of geopolitics seemed to me to be a very interesting way to, to, to get a handle on thinking about um, lots of things. And I duly went on um, to do the subsequent political geography lecture, um, just called the geopolitics of climate change, where I started to try to tease out that. So the genesis of my last few years thinking really comes from this. Um, and it also comes from seeing a series of um, <coughs> variations on the theme in this image. Because this, um, whether a certain president south of uh, the 49th actually knows it or not, um, is a, is that a wall? If it's not made of concrete, well, never mind. Uh, the barrier across the southern frontier, is that a frontier? Is it a border? Um, the vocabulary here isn't always very helpful. 
Um, but that image suggests the wall um, uh, across the southern um, border of the United States. And of course, for me, the crucial point about this is that it's, apart from the fact it's hideously ugly, um, but it is actually designed uh, to prevent people moving across a landscape that can change, and hence these strange um, uh, sloping structures on either side of the wall are designed specifically to allow the barrier to rise up and down as the sand dunes move underneath it, so that the landscape can change, but people can't move in response to it. Neither, for that matter, can numerous um, quadrupeds um, uh, as well. Uh, so clearly here um, is uh, a recognition of environmental change and a refusal to allow sp the crucial species to move as a consequence of the changing environment. And it seemed to be really a metaphor for the disconnect between um, administrative spaces that are precisely demarcated and an environment that is fundamentally dynamic and our attempts to fix borders in a cha rapidly changing environment seem to me to get to the heart of the dilemmas um, that globalization um, and sustainability uh, seem to, uh, to, to be um, grappling with, often without a vocabulary that seem to actually get to the heart of many of these issues. Every now and again, the terms just don't seem to fit. And so it's that kind of problem that I've been struggling with over the last um, few years. Uh, we have also become uh, an urban species, if you believe the statistics from the United Nations. It was some time in the last decade, the various studies have given us a different year in which we became 50% uh, um, uh, present in cities um, as opposed to non-urban areas. But Steve Graham has been picking up on the, the vertical um, idea that I referred to from Stuart Eldon earlier. And in this wonderful book from a couple of years ago, he actually started to think about power, sustainability, construction, violence, and related issues by looking vertically, not horizontally. Um, and this indeed has encouraged me to think about um, inequalities in the built landscape in all sorts of different ways. Um, and if you ever thought that the technology that mattered um, uh, was something terribly mundane and terribly basic. There's a fascinating theme in Steve's book uh, where it all comes down to ropes and cables. Because of course, the ropes and cables which allow us to build upwards in skyscrapers are also the technology that allow us to dig ever deeper into the earth to get the materials to build the skyscrapers, which the ropes and cables allow us to, 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 to go up and down. Elevators and um, the things that go up and down mines are crucial to the expanding capabilities of humanity to change environments and to build structures in all sorts of different ways. And he's got some fascinating stuff in here about luxury condominiums and rooftop gardens and swimming pools on the top of buildings where only the elites can get to, um, often using helicopters to simply skip all the infrastructure that makes their mode of, of, of consumption possible. Can I take pictures of these? Before? Please do. Oh, I'll happily you. circulate them. The, the, all these images, apart from the, the very last one, which I took with my phone, um, are just pinched off various things on the internet. So the I'm probably violating all sorts of copyright all down the line. The PowerPoint <laughs> will be on the website. Um, if you wish to, um, to, to, to take pictures, do, but they're easy to find these things. Um, when you look at works like Steve's um, wonderful book, uh, the sheer scale of what humanity is doing to the planet becomes clear. Uh, if it wasn't already clear to you, read Steve Graham and it will become em eminently clear. And of course, it's precisely the scale of the transformation that is raising the most fundamental problems for thinking about sustainability. How do you sustain? What do you sustain? by what policy instruments might whatever it is you deem to be desirable to sustain be sustained. Um, those questions are not clear at all anymore. Um, and in that sense, the traditional assumptions about conservation of stable environments that we were protecting from depredations and unwelcome intrusions by human agencies, that um, uh, is, is a noble pursuit by all means. But in many ways, the sheer scale of human, humanity's impact now um, 
is such that it makes those uh, ways of thinking about sustainability um, no longer very helpful in many contexts. The sheer scale of the change has inspired people to talk about the Anthropocene and I've been talking about the Anthropocene probably more than I should for the last 15 years um, because we need a name for these new contexts. We need a way of summarizing um, the sheer scale of what has um, been changing uh, and doing that um, uh, this is the most pithy um, mathematical attempt uh, at representing it um, with the Anthropocene equation uh, published in the Anthropocene um, Review, I think, fairly recently. Two th no, it's now two years ago. The idea being that the last four billion years, um, astronomic forces, geophysical forces, and the internal dynamics of the Earth system uh, really um, uh, were the dominant shaping um, forces. How um, environment changes over time is a function of those um, three factors. The suggestion uh, in this formulation is that this is now fundamentally changed um, because the human factor has become so much bigger. H is industrialized societies on the right hand part of that diagram. Um, and the interconnectedness, all those trade paths that are um, mapped there are a dramatic new phenomena um, in the Earth system. And we need to understand the Earth system uh, in these terms. And one can argue that, in fact, these trade routes are precisely um, the accelerated um, patterns of interconnection, uh, which the word globalization um, st still is the, uh, the perhaps the best word for um, understanding the accelerated interconnections across the globe, um, which is, of course, crucial to the rapid growth of the world economy over the last little while. The term Anthropocene has become much more widespread in the last few years um, and uh, encapsulated in, in Lewis and Maslin's book last year just called The Human Planet with that very clever um, subtitle of how we created the Anthropocene. The double meaning of course being the construction of a human planet but also a whole knowledge base, a whole vocabulary, a whole series of scientific um, uh, investigations which are encapsulated in this term of the Anthropocene to suggest that the new force um, in the Earth system um, is at least industrialized, rich part of humanity, dramatically changing how the Earth system functions. And doing so um, very rapidly, of course, which is one of the crucial things um, that we now need to stop and think about. It's the sheer speed of change um, which is uh, crucial. Uh, to understanding climate change as well as all the other transformations that are at the heart of the uh, discussion about the Anthropocene. Um, this actually is a diagram, if you've um, seen it online, that goes back about 20,000 years. I've just captured the last little piece of it um, on this image um, uh, for, the, uh, for the PowerPoint. Um, I did get the folks back at the Center for International Governance Innovation um, a little while ago actually to scroll it down a screen as I did the talk about Earth history. Um, and then I said, oh, can I have that file, please? I'd love to do this again for some other lectures. Uh, yeah, but uh, Professor Dalby, it's about seven terabytes because of the scrolling function. We had, okay, forget it. I'm, even my laptop's not doing seven terabytes or something. Utterly ridiculous the way they had done it. Um, the point about this is that uh, it uh, shows the line right down the middle is the average temperature over the last 10,000 years of the planet. Um, uh, and that incredibly rapid shift at the bottom tied into those various things that are noted there, of course, is the point. To try and suggest that um, the dramatic change, if it's not the last 40 years as the mathematical um, uh, formula was suggesting in the previous slide, um, it is certainly extremely rapid, and it's that rapidity of change that is one of the crucial um, parts of the um, Anthropocene discussion, um, which runs across all sorts of gamuts um, of the, uh, the transformation of the planet. Um, humans have messed up, converted, changed, modified, whatever term you want to use in all sorts of different ways. Um, and all of these diagrams um, are basically suggesting uh, 
uh, that the Earth system and socioeconomic trends are basically two different ways of thinking about the same phenomena. And in that sense, what I guess my one of my central messages in this lecture is that we need to understand the um, globalization phenomena, the rapid acceleration of the connections across the globe, which are those trade routes as well as the communications and all the rest of it, as a material transformation. Because if we're going to talk seriously about what it is whoever should be sustaining, um, we need to get that context very clear. It's very rapid transformation, um, but we need to understand that the connectivity that globalization focuses on um, is in fact a series of dramatic transformations of both um, uh, terrestrial and, let us not forget, um, oceanic phenomena as well. And I'll come back to that point um, at the end. Skeptics might argue um, that this isn't very new, actually. Um, back when you were an undergraduate, Dalby, long before you came to UVic to do a master's, don't you remember? You were talking, yes, indeed, we were talking about the limits to growth. We were talking about um, uh, what would happen when the world ran out of resources, which was due to happen sometime around about now, more or less. Look, please, at that graph. It is the iconic um, standard-run world model that was the heart of the discussion from the 1970s of limits to growth. So the assumption is that, in fact, this whole Anthropocene stuff um, uh, we've been here before, we've seen it before. But I want to emphasize just a couple of things here because the resource running out assumption um, has not played out, at least in terms of mineral resources. It is certainly not played out in terms of um, fossil fuels, um, anything like what that graph suggested. And if you look at the bottom, the pollution diagram was supposed to rise rapidly and then fall away. And of course, the crucial thing about um, uh, climate change in particular is that that is not what is going to happen. Carbon dioxide is going to be along, around a very long time in the atmosphere. It is not going to follow the collapse in the next decade or two that was predicted back down to its pre-industrial um, level as that standard run of the mo standard model um, world model standard run, let me say it correctly, um, uh, suggested. In fact, I had the great pleasure of finally meeting Jürgen Randers, um, one of the original authors of this, um, uh, about 15 months ago, 18 months ago. Um, and he looked at it and he said, yeah, nobody has ever pointed that out. It's different in all the other runs, but the standard run, the symbolic image which is associated with the limits to, to growth, has this fundamentally different um, from what we are now talking about um, in terms of climate change. Uh, so yes, we have been talking about this kind of stuff, but the Anthropocene discussion um, suggests that at least in some crucial dimensions, um, these earlier discussions missed some of the points which now matter much more. Because of course, in terms of climate change, the problem isn't a shortage of fossil fuel resources. The problem is we've way too much of the stuff. It's not a scarcity issue. It's an abundance issue. It's what to do to not burn it rather than problems of how trying to get more to burn. Um, and we need to be very careful um, about some of these uh, assumptions that the old thinking about this still works. Because at least um, in that part of the limits to growth, um, uh, that is fundamentally different from what we now understand uh, to be our predicament. If you'll allow me a little fantasy for a few moments, um, the crucial um, suggestion recently uh, about how it is we think about all those big cities that Steve Graham was talking about um, in his book um, is the emergence of what is now often simply called a technosphere. Um, the idea being that there are artificial products of our technology which are now changing how the system functions both on the surface and because of all the satellites and everything else out into outer space as well. Thirty trillion tons of stuff, one estimate I read recently suggested as a consequence of human activities, our technologies of one form or another. This is a major new entity. It's basically a geological scale change um, in the planet.
And of course, the reason for using the word Anthropocene is to suggest geology. This is bigger than traditional understandings of environment. And it's in this context, this new context, we now have to think about what sustainability might mean. The responsible husbanding of resources, the original notions of sustainability, um, don't fit in a world of fossil fuels. They don't fit in a world which is increasingly artificial because of the rapid growth of the technosphere. Most of the focus um, is on climate change for many good reasons, but it is important to suggest that the Anthropocene is about more um, than just climate change. We do have to grapple with climate change because it is, of course, one of the crucial dimensions um, to all of this. And in case you haven't been paying attention to climate science, um, here's the shortest, most elegant, um, and most sophisticated scientific paper I've yet seen published on the topic. <laughs> Complete with um, careful documentation in the footnotes, please note. If you're going to be a climate scientist and go on a protest, you need to advertise your trade. And what better way to do it than uh, make sure that the footnotes are all carefully um, uh, included in the bottom of your um, protest mm -hmm. sign. But is the fifth point correct? What can we do to fix it, the warming being uh, bad and we're sure it's us. If we are going to think about governance, if we are going to think about um, how it is that we might um, tackle the consequences of globalization, uh, we have to think about governance and we inevitably turn to um, things like international organizations and the United Nations in particular. It is fascinating that the agenda for sustainable development, which is really the global document that encapsulates the policy aspirations, if nothing more, um, of the sustainability agenda, now actually talks in terms of transform transforming our world. Is that a statement of the obvious or a promissory note? And of course, the ambiguity um, in that title appeals to me immensely. Um, we are transforming our world. The question, of course, about the agenda is how we will transform it. Um, and this is, of course, the, the, the crucial question. The most interesting, for me at least, scientific discussion of this um, is around the debate about planetary boundaries um, and the so-called safe operating space uh, for planet Earth. Spatial metaphors are unavoidable in political discourse. Those ones aren't all immediately obvious, and um, we need to stop and think about what is actually meant there. Um, but let me simply walk you through a couple of the discussions um, which I think are particularly um, germane uh, to the rest of my talk today. Will Stefan, um, Johann Rockström, and the rest of what I simply call the Stockholm Gang um, these days because much of this has been um, connected up with the Stockholm Resilience Center and the Environment Institute um, in Stockholm. Um, and Johan Rockström has made a lot of the running along with Will Steffen, who of course is the other end of the planet down in Australia most of the time. Um, but nonetheless, the Stockholm crew or the Stockholm gang will do as shorthand for the people that have been thinking their way through this. And that paper, The Trajectories of the Earth System, um, uh, published uh, recently, um, uh, is fairly blunt in pointing out that we have got to stop and think carefully about what the trajectory of the Earth system is, how we are in the SDG language transforming the Earth system, um, because we are um, making choices about that. Of course, at this stage, the Marxist in the room always jumps up and says, who's we? Right? Um, because it's not all of humanity evenly, obviously. But humanity as a totality, or to be more precise, the rich and powerful decision-making part of humanity, uh, which to a small extent includes most um, of the consumers um, that uh, attend universities in the global north, mm -hmm. um, uh, are in fact making profound decisions about how the Earth system will be uh, transferred, uh, transformed. What matters to the analysis in the Stefan and Rockström um, trajectory paper 
um, is that they're increasingly worried about the earth as a system and the interconnectedness of the bits in the system. Um, so what matters here is not any one single um, potential um, transformative process on one of these major um, uh, parts of the biosphere um, system, but the potential interconnections between them. Um, if one tips into a new configuration, uh, if it crosses some kind of a threshold um, into uh, a new configuration, it will have consequences for at least some of the others. And we may end up with what they call a tipping cascade um, uh, as one thing affects another, affects another, affects another, a cascade from one tip, tipping point in one system to another to another. Because the point about the Anthropocene is we have to consider the planet as a system. Some of these are relatively disconnected, but the potential for uh, serious interconnections between them, one of them um, setting off um, knock-on effects on the others, uh, is what has been increasingly worrying the uh, folks that cons Con that consider um, the trajectories and the necessity of avoiding a tipping point, uh, a tipping cascade um, is because, so they are arguing, um, that would lead us towards a hothouse pathway as accelerating change makes the world hotter and hotter, further destabilizing yet more of the systems. And avoiding the hothouse pathway, um, their terminology, uh, is of course what is the um, uh, impetus behind this because the alternative has to be some kind of stabilized world or stabilized earth in which um, we avoid uh, crossing various thresholds and setting these tipping cascades in motion because if we do set them in motion the argument is very simple that the dramatic disruptions um, set in motion are simply going to be beyond um, the capabilities of a global civilization with seven billion and growing numbers of humans uh, to actually cope with and maintain the complex social system that we have built um, over the last few generations uh, with the globalization phenomena. It's not just, as I keep saying, climate change um, because they have developed the planetary boundaries framework um, and this is uh, Actually, this is the original. No, this isn't. This is the updated version. Um, I play around with them, just trying to get pretty pictures to put on, on, on PowerPoints, and suddenly realized that I'm not using an older one there because the novel entities uh, one is in, and that's the updated version of this, the 2015 version of the planetary boundaries. The point about this that I want you to take away is that at least in some cases, um, we're in the red zone. We have transcended um, what can be understood to be the sort of the safe uh, zone uh, in terms of not causing major disruptions. Phosphorus and nitrogen, because of fertilizers and agriculture, are way off scale. We are well into, according to most suggestions, the sixth extinction event in the planetary history uh, because of the um, disruptions to numerous species. Uh, there's a huge big de technical debate about how far into that we already are, although if the newspaper reports um, in the last few weeks once again on crashing insect populations in both Europe and Costa Rica are anywhere close to ac accurate, uh, we may be further into that red zone in the biosphere integrity than we uh, already have realized. There is good news in there too, of course, because um, in the case of ozone, um, we have managed to um, uh, roll back. Uh, we haven't solved the ozone problem yet but by uh, eliminating the production of CFCs in at least most parts of the world, some doubts about a few rogue production plants still, uh, we have uh, not transcended the stratospheric ozone depletion barrier precisely because we got our act together and actually did something about it uh, back in the, uh, in the 80s, back when Canada was actually still doing intelligent things about global environment. Elizabeth May was actually working for the federal government around about then, you may remember, or maybe you don't remember. The response to this um, in terms of climate change we know about, um, but it is worth pointing out that the um, planetary boundaries framework suggests that there are two um, of these boundaries that are uh, crucial, climate change um, and biosphere integrity being uh, 
the two that alone, they argue, can tip the world into a new configuration. Um, the others uh, may be less capable alone of um, doing the global scale um, ecological transformation. Responding to those, um, we have the Sustainable Development Goals agreed in the fall of 2015, a couple of months before climate change explicitly um, uh, generated great jubilation in Paris when they signed off on a document um, at COP21, um, which in some ways does mark uh, the moment at which finally the world came to its senses and said, we've got to do something about this. My students are horrified when I make that point, um, arguing that, well, what do you mean? The blah, 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 blah. You know, I mean, they didn't solve the problem. To which I have to say to my students, well, actually getting everybody on board to admit that there was a problem was actually quite a lot of progress. Um, it doesn't cut any ice with anybody under 30. Um, and there's a generational politics to this that is really interesting, and I'll come back to um, in the Q&A if you want me to, 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 to talk about it. The point about this, however, um, is back to that original diagram at the beginning of my talk. Um, the agencies that are given responsibility for dealing with it are still those bordered territorial states. Um, uh, we don't have a new um, global governance system beyond an agreement on the part of all states with the subsequent um, promise to leave on the part of Trump. Um, but nonetheless, most United States agencies are still assuming that they're um, going to be in um, uh, the arrangement. The point here is that uh, um, we have got a recognition that there's a problem. Um, there is a whole lot of discussion about what to do with it, but simply getting us to recognize that climate change has to be dealt with, um, I think, has been um, crucially important. The failure to come up with a comprehensive, radical, rapid decarbonization plan, which is what my students, of course, thought that Paris should produce, um, uh, raises the question about, well, if states aren't acting anything like quickly enough, uh, they're not doing the transforming thing, um, uh, where are the pressure points? Where is the politics um, that might actually uh, deal with this? And of course, at least in this country, um, uh, part of the most interesting politics is around pipelines. No, this isn't the Wet'suwet'en um, uh, territories uh, last week. Um, it's an older um, uh, photograph, and I use it in, in, in here because it actually manages to put a whole bunch of things um, together. Um, it gets the territory, territory stuff, it gets direct um, discussion about clean energy, um, uh, and, and uh, we all live downstream. Um, tar sands are not oil. Um, the question of, 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 you know, is it um, tar, is it bitumen, is it oil, um, uh, and, and what extreme measures are taken to dig this stuff out of the ground um, are all there. The idle no more um, insistence in the generational politics of get busy, do things, um, needless to say, uh, over on Main Island where I live when I can, um, the recycling center folks um, put a sign as you drive into the recycling center that simply says idle no more, which of course is a no wonderful pun on turn your engine off while you're unloading your vehicle, right? Uh, caused me a great chuckle, that one. Um, the point about this uh, is that um, pipeline politics has become one of the pressure points, um, one of the focal points on the uh, politics of um, climate change. And I emphasize pipeline debates um, because it goes back to the point I made about the limits to growth, about the fact we have to leave our, most of the remaining reserves in the ground if we are going to get serious um, about, uh, about climate change. And to me, that seems to be very clearly geological politics, not environmental politics. Uh, and actually thinking about um, it in those terms um, is something that the Anthropocene opens up as a different way. It's no longer about protection intact environments being maintained in that. But it's actually now about focusing on production much more explicitly. What are we making? What are we producing? Are we producing carbon dioxide or are we producing windmills and solar panels? Are we producing V8 engines or are we producing those fancy new electric things that I don't quite understand in Teslas or whatever? Um, I mean, there are very immediate production decisions which have very long-term 
uh, consequences for the uh, fate of the of the planet. And thinking about um, politics now in geological terms, um, in terms of the long term physical remnants, bits and pieces of engines, carbon dioxide as a legacy um, is a geological politics, which I think shifts at least in part our understanding of how it is that we are going to think about our long term um, security. And the politics around that, of course, has been um, very fraught of late. This is Standing Rock a while back. Um, it looks like a battlefield. Those are not actual um, fires from exploding munitions. But um, the really interesting thing that caught me as somebody who spent a lot of time thinking about geopolitics in the military is the veterans from American veterans from the Middle Eastern wars showing up to help the protesters with their logistics because they had the skill sets of doing logistics and they realized that that actually might help um, the protesters. Asked why, they simply said, well, we can't go on with fossil fuels. We can't go on um, blowing the Middle East to bits every time we have a, a, a hissy fit about um, some Arab sheik not doing our bidding. Um, this world is unsustainable and therefore we are taking the side of the protesters against the military quasi-military security forces that are threatening the protest camps. That was the point at which um, I went, wait a minute. Um, there is a question here about who's securing what that, um, and who's using military-style logistics to accomplish which um, that really does need, us, uh, need, need our attention. Um, and there's a certain young congresswoman from New York recently elected who has recently said, go in there being involved in the protest was absolutely crucial to her decision to run in New York. Um, so the protest camps, the consequences of then her advertising anybody who will listen, the Green New Deal, um, does seem to me um, to be a politics here that we really need to pay more attention to some of those connections. And, 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 and I you know, maybe this is, 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 is the beginning of, 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 of something that really uh, will get attention. Because, of course, how it is that we think about adapting to climate change requires us to rethink a lot of things. Um, Suvakul and Linné um, here um, are talking about uh, all sorts of engineering works um, as a response uh, to climate change adaptation, which may, they argue, simply make a whole lot of things worse, particularly the injustice um, issues worse if they are not handled carefully and if they are not thought through um, uh, in much uh, more careful suggestions, uh, much more carefully um, than is often suggested in terms of immediate development projects that are engineering projects. They talk about uh, entrenching injustice, um, uh, expelling people in, and, 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 and um, enhancing um, some of the deleterious consequences of development if you don't stop and think through um, how it is uh, that we actually do climate change um, adaptation. And thinking it through brings us back to the questions of well, what are we adapting to? Um, what literally are we making? Are we going to make very complicated um, hydrological management schemes as in the cover illustration on their book? Um, uh, maybe the softer path of large windmills might be a much better way to think about adaptation um, rather than massive engineering. And then yet somebody will say, wait a minute, what about tidal power? Um, and the Danes, the Danes these days have got that tidal power project up and running. One of the most interesting thinkers on all of this is, of course, um, Bruno Latour. If you haven't seen his latest essay, um, published recently by Polity, um, by all means do read it. Um, it's uh, probably a lot easier to read um, than the Faces of Gaia book, which was the previous collection of essays on this, although intellectually probably a little less interesting. It's a much more personal book than some of his earlier stuff, and the title is very interesting indeed, Down to Earth. In the chaos and confusion of the globalized economy, we all need somewhere to land, is what he's basically arguing. Um, I'm not sure that the translations between French and English work very well on some of this stuff. I'm suspicious about the translations, but my French isn't good enough to um, even think about trying to do um, a better interpretation. 
Bruno de Tour, um, social studies of, of science, um, uh, key thinker on this, comes from a family um, of winemakers and he actually returns to Terrar thinking about the specifics of his family um, uh, vineyard um, at the end of the book saying everybody needs somewhere to land. And yet there's a huge irony on this because of course it's precisely climate change um, that is messing up um, great production, um, frosts, heat waves, changing rainfall patterns, all of these things are making um, traditional grape growers in particular places increasingly nervous um, and in some cases um, making the traditional grapes uh, impossible to grow in areas where they've grown for, for, for centuries. So there's something very ironic about Latour actually trying to come back down to earth um, to ground ourselves in a particular place when of course the larger um, climatic regime is changing the environmental conditions in particular places. It's also um, uh, something that I think we need to bear in mind um, and I mentioned this just briefly earlier in my talk assuming that we come down to earth in a particular terrestrial place is of course always in danger of missing the fundamentally important insights of the earth system um, that it isn't just land it's also ocean and atmosphere if recent headlines are accurate um, that 90 percent of the heating of the earth has actually gone into the oceans um, despite the fact there are 70 percent of the surface area of the planet we really do need to stop and think about um, the earth system as a system that includes the atmosphere and the oceans uh, more explicitly and I was a little concerned that Latour was abandoning his earlier attempts to invoke Gaia in the previous work um, and coming back to a very geographically fixed um, location as a solution to dealing with the anxieties of climate politics. Um, clearly he has in mind some notion of resilience uh, which is the buzzword of our moment. If you're not doing Anthropocene you're doing resilience these days aren't you? Um, it's everywhere um, and uh, in many ways it seems to me that it is a misnomer. The capacity to prepare for disruptions, recover from shocks and stresses, adapt and grow from a disruptive experience. Yes that's all good and all students are told that they have to be resilient um, in whatever degree program they're in. Uh, when you get a bad grain you have to bounce back and the, the language goes through um, marketing, it goes through um, education, it goes through state planning. Um, the little hashtag at the bottom is better. Uh, rebuild better because of course one of the major adaptation problems that we have to deal with um, is the assumption from in insurance and in disaster planning that you simply repair and rebuild what got trashed. That presupposes a situation of stationarity. It is presupposes a normal set of environmental circumstances in which there are occasional perturbations but basically um, the system is operating around um, a predictable um, norm. The whole point about um, rapid change in the Anthropocene is precisely that that assumption cannot now be the basis for intelligent planning. Um, Naomi Klein fans of course know all about um, the problems with this formulation of resilience because of course in terms of markets uh, what we end up with in responses to storms is what she calls disaster capitalism um, and in many cases the institutions that can adapt and grow happen to be um, corporations that have the flexibility um, to adapt after a major disruption and if you haven't read her shock doctrine um, as a corrective to the exuberance with which resilience is often dealt with um, good lord it's nearly a decade it's more than a decade old now it's 2007 uh, it's well worth going back and thinking about um, she did a um, uh, a small much more recent book about uh, Puerto Rico um, and Hurricane Maria which is well worth um, a read in terms of thinking about how while this is all very well in theory um, the practical political economies on the ground um, are something we need to grapple with uh, much more explicitly. We need to get beyond resilience and think about the disruption of the Anthropocene and Peter Kareva has upset a lot of people over the years making this point long loud and, and, and clear. This one happens to be a version that shows up in global policy 
um, and is a particularly articulate suggestion um, of the m difficulties of resilience and the necessity to think about much more profound um, transformations. But even if we are thinking about profound transformations, um, we do need to stop and think very carefully about how it is that we rapidly change. And it's been fascinating to watch Bill McKibben. Um, this is a graphic from his um, New Republic article of three, four years ago, um, in which he's actually suggesting that America needs to mobilize a solar production system in the same way as it did in 1942 um, in response to its joining the uh, in, in the, the Second World War. Um, military metaphors, uh, emergency, uh, anybody been paying attention to the language of uh, wars and things in the last week? Um, may not give us the kind of policy responses um, uh, that are needed um, to dramatically change economy um, rapidly. Um, on the other hand, the necessity to rapidly change the economy requires us to act in ways that are not um, the normal market-driven um, policies. The final slide, uh, my final point, is that to pull all this together, um, we need to think about mundane um, uh, production decisions about many things. Uh, in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, more or less a year ago exactly, Dawn Stover uh, wrote a wonderful little article in a sort of awfully wonderful sort of way. Um, in which he pointed out that the money that Trump wanted to spend on his wall, and this is a year ago, more or less exactly, or it's back in the headlines exactly a year later, which is why I'm talking about it. Um, the money that Trump wants to spend on a wall to stop people moving across that border would, she argued, be much better spent on climate um, mitigation and adaptation because she pointed out that much of Florida is going to disappear under the waves fairly shortly as um, if climate change isn't tackled fairly soon. And this is indeed um, Miami, um, and this is indeed a construction project on a waterfront um, in Miami, because her argument is that money um, for the wall um, is misunderstanding the important border that the United States actually needs to deal with. Um, the border that it needs to worry about is its coastline, not its terrestrial border um, with Mexico, because the consequences of not dealing with the coastline issues, both in terms of preventing climate change and building um, infrastructure to resist um, the worst depredations of rising sea levels, um, are going to be, that's going to be a whole lot worse um, than whatever disruptions small numbers of migrant ca um, uh, caravan um, uh, uh, folks moving across the border might actually do. And completely misunderstanding which border is most important means that Trump is likely to dramatically misspend um, uh, what money he has available for dealing with border issues uh, in the United States. And it seems to me that um, that uh, is a useful, simple image because it also reminds us that we need to take a detour. It's also a very mundane, everyday production decisions have global consequences. All of that, it seems to me, is captured in this uh, photo, which you may also take a photo of if you wish. I haven't copyrighted it, um, but it was on my cell phone in Miami last year when I happened to be down there, as it happens, talking about this topic. Okay, I will call it quits there, and thank you for your attention.